myself or Ole, have ever preached in one sermon. And it goes up. And it's good. So go ahead and take your watch off. Don't let it bother you, amen? No, but uh, we're, we're going to start what is known around the world as the Acts series, amen? And so what we're going to do is we're going to dive into God's Word and really dig in to the book of Acts. And uh, I have the honor for to start it off. Chapters 1 through 8 here this morning. Come on, bro. Got a lot of material, so stick with me. Keep up. And uh, it's going to be an awesome time. You know, many people as they grow up, they want to do great things. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, I've wanted to do great things since I was a young boy. You can ask my mom. She's here. But uh, I remember, I never shared this one because it, it just, I realized how embarrassing it was. But when I was young, I really wanted to fly. Like, really bad. That's not the embarrassing part. It was about the method to which I wanted to do that. I had a dream. I wanted to be a butterfly. Time 
to inspire us to do the same. Jesus would then follow this up by giving them what would be the vision of the first century church. In verses 7 it says, He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by His own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Jesus would tell them that they are to start there as they are presently in Jerusalem. He says, you're to expand my kingdom to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Yeah. This term, ends of the earth, this phrase, is actually seen 48 times in the scriptures. It's funny enough, 42 times is in the Old Testament, and 6 times in the New Testament. But this is to say, this is when all those 42 times it was talked about, it would be fulfilled here in the book of Acts. Showing us that all 28 chapters of the book of Acts, as we study them all, I'm going to do chapters 1 through 8, not the whole book, amen? We're not going to do the direct 1 to 28 today, but just chapters 1 through 8. But it's to give us the expansion from Jerusalem all the way to Samaria. But if we're going to be building God's church, as this is, since it does encompass the kingdom of God, this gives us the blueprint of how God's church should be in the 21st century as well. And so I think it's time for us to really glean and learn and imitate what was the spirit of our brothers and sisters in the first century so that we are not trying to reform the will. We are here to restore what God's church is all about. Amen? The first thing you need if you're going to build a great church is the Great Commission. Let's look at what I believe is the parallel to this same account here in Acts chapter 1 and verse 7 to 8 in Matthew 28. Maybe you've read this passage uh, a couple times. If you're in the church here, you do some Bible studies. The Great Commission. If we do not adopt and apply the Great Commission that Jesus gives, then we cannot build a great church. In Matthew 28 and verse 16, it says, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him with some doubt. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, Jesus comes to them in the same way he came to them in Acts chapter 1, and he tells them what exactly he would expect of them to do. He says, you, my faithful disciples, go out, make disciples, do that for which has been done for you. Then baptize those you would make disciples. Then teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And he says, in accompanying with that, I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Isn't it just awesome to see the promise of God from his word, that if we do his will, he will not be around us. He will not just be, you know, in agreement with us. He will be with us. And I see in the Metro Coast, God has been with us. But it's not because we're special by personality. It's not because we have an extra zeal added to the church. It's because we're obeying the will of God. Amen? But see, talking about changing the world in our generation cannot be something we simply talk about. Yeah. It has got to be what we are all about. Yeah. Now here's the thing, how do you know if you are part of God's great church and you are doing the Great Commission? You actually have a plan to do so. And here in God's church, we are not just talking about world evangelism right. and getting to the ends of the earth. Yeah. We actually have a plan to right. get to the ends of the earth. We have what's called the Crown of Thorns Project. It started back in 2006 when the church here in L.A. had just begun. And Kim and some of the major leaders in the church decided, hey, you know what? We cannot be all talk. We have to walk the walk. And so it started with one church here in L.A. And now we are over 170 churches, 66 nations, from 42 disciples to over 11,000 disciples in part of a church that actually believes and has a plan to fulfill the Great Commission. The question for you 
is are you just a part of that church that's fulfilling the Great Commission? Or are you yourself actually living out the Great Commission? See, the Bible would teach us here that we should have a global vision, but we still have to act locally. And so as I share my faith, I'm not just thinking about, well, well, well they're going to do it all over the world. I've got to do it in my own life. It was so awesome to hear as a uh, good news from the EMC over in London that our dear uh, sister, the women's ministry leader for the uh, for the Southland, she reached out to a gal that was the first baptism in Belgium. Amen. <laughs> when we act locally, we make an impact globally. So how's it going for you? Living out the Great Commission. Is this the heartbeat of why? We do what we do. Is this our focus? Or is this just something you agree with to ride the gravy train of glory in God's kingdom? The question I would ask us to put upon ourselves when it comes to the Great Commission, if everyone was like me, what kind of church would this be? When you have the Great Commission, you need to accompany with that the great message. Acts chapter 2. Acts 2. And we see here that they're in Jerusalem, and as Jesus told them to wait for the Holy Spirit to come on them with power, we see that in Acts 2, at the day of Pentecost, that the Holy Spirit would have sent in the room for which they are staying, and it says a violent wind comes in, shakes the whole house, and it says a ball of fire came to rest on each of the apostles' heads. And they begin to speak in other languages. And this was their message when the power of the Holy Spirit came upon them. In Acts 2 and verse 22, it says here, Men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. We have to imagine the moment that we're setting ourselves in right here. This is the Apostle Peter, who 50 days before this moment was literally cowering at proclaiming Jesus as his rabbi in the presence of slave girls. Meaning he was full, not of faith in the Holy Spirit, but full of cowardice in that moment. Instead of taking the opportunity to proclaim and stick to his word for which he said in Matthew 26 and verse 31 that he would be willing to go to death with Jesus, he backs down from his convictions. But 50 days later, and we know from John 21 that Peter was restored by Jesus himself and reinstated to his position. Peter, being given the keys to the kingdom, he stands before what would have been upwards of 2.5 million people. So maybe just a little bit more than a couple of slave girls. And instead of backing down, he preaches with full conviction and he proclaims the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, I believe many of us can relate to Peter's story. Where there have been moments where you've been tempted to back down yeah. from preaching the full message of Jesus. You know, the gospel has been so obliterated and contorted to fit what would be our itching ears would want to hear. People have made the gospel all about everybody's accepted. You don't have to change. The gospel has been twisted to where you can fundamentally find whatever church you want to be a part of. To where there are churches now where they don't even have a lesson. They simply have a service filled with singing. Now, singing is awesome, amen? Amen. We got to sing our hearts out here, amen? And like the song leaders, we got to learn some new songs, amen? But the full 
gospel is not just about singing and praises to God. It's about hearing the convicting, inspirational, zealous word of God and responding to it. You know, many times you can be tempted to only talk about the positive parts of the gospel. But Peter said, you, with the help of wicked men, put Jesus to death. You are responsible for the death of the Messiah. He laid upon them the bad news before he presented them with the good news. You know, many times we just want the good news. But we understand that we can take those things for granted when you don't understand what you could have received instead. I mean, if this was the Old Testament, I wouldn't be up here preaching the word. I'd have a sacrificed lamb here and I'd have hyssop branches and I'd be spraying blood everywhere right now. And we couldn't be appearing before the presence of God as we understand the scriptures teach. We'd only be able to come before God once a year. They could only come before God once a year. But for us here in the 21st century, because of the sacrifice of our Lord, we get to appear before God every single day if you are a sold out disciple of Jesus. Are you grateful for the message? He then goes on to proclaim the great message in verse 29. He says, brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried. And his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke, to the spoke of the resurrection of the Christ. That he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised his Jesus to life. And we are all witnesses of the fact. You see, Peter here goes on to preach that the resurrection of Jesus Christ proves that he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Because not only did he conquer this life, but he conquered the very thing that would call life quits. He conquered death. And he takes those keys of death and he hands it to every disciple and says, now use it as the very weapon against the forces of darkness. All the faithful 11 disciples... As we know in Acts chapter 1, 12 to 14, Matthias replaced Judas because he killed himself. But all the faithful died martyrs' deaths. They died for the message. This was not something they just believed in. This was their eyewitness account. Peter here who was preaching would eventually go on to die crucified upside down next to his wife. Who would have said... Hey, Peter, if you just renounce your eyewitness testimony, at the very least, we'll save your wife. History would tell us that his wife would look over at him and say, Peter, I'm already saved. They would die. You would have Thomas, doubting Thomas, who would go on to preach from the cross, not being crucified with the normal nails and the, and the wrought iron nails in his wrist, but he would be crucified with ropes prolonging the process of crucifixion. History would tell us that he preached three days from the cross. Bartholomew, he was not crucified in an ordinary way. He was skinned alive and then crucified. You had first century brothers and sisters that had their kids possessed from them, dipped in cow's blood, sent into the arena to be chased around by lions. While they watched, Christians were burned at the stake. This was all for the message of Jesus Christ. That he actually died and he resurrected. It's very emblematic of 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 13 to 16 where Paul says, I am compelled. And why does he say he's compelled? Because he's convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. So how do you know when somebody's convinced Jesus died for them? Because the message is not just something they believe in. It's something they preach in and out every single day of their life. When you look at the tomb of Buddha, his grave holds his bones. When you look at Confucius, his grave still holds his bones. 
When you look at the tomb of Muhammad, his grave still holds his bones. When you look at even the tomb of Abraham, the bones are still in there. But when you look at the tomb of Jesus Christ, the tomb is empty. That's why I come here to church every Sunday, amen? What would be the application of the message? Verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God made it this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children. And for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. The response of those that heard the message was simple. Brothers, what shall we do? I pray that after you leave here, you have one simple question to ask. What do I got to do to be saved? I believe what's permeated our generation is a great spiritual insecurity where people don't fundamentally know the way to follow Jesus. And so they simply adopt what their parents have taught them, but they never ask the questions for themselves. What was the message of Jesus Christ? Instead, they just assume that those who told them were correct instead of studying it for themselves. We see the message was not just believe and be saved. It was not pray Jesus in your heart and be saved. It was not you were saved by anything alone, but you were saved by the blood of Jesus Christ when you repent and get baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. The question we have to ask ourselves when it comes to this great message, if everyone was like me, what kind of church would this be? Number three, if we're going to build a great church, we're going to need great commitment. Acts 2 and verse 42, the Bible reads here, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. We will never build a great church unless we have great commitment. It's amazing to see such an incredible response to the message of Jesus. It says here 3,000 were added to their number in one day. Can you imagine? I can. I have a vision that we will be there one day. That instead of just having one horse trough out there, we're going to have to have 50 lined up in rows out there in the courtyard of the SDA. That at, at the same time in unison, we're just going to have to, all right, everybody ready? And it's going to be not a wave of people raising their hands. It's going to be a wave of one by one people getting baptized. What was the number that these 3,000 were added to? Well, it says in Acts chapter 1 and verse 15, it teaches us that there were 120 believers, 120 still in Jesus' ministry. We know among that group would have been the 11 apostles, eventually to have Matthias to complete the 12, but it would have also been the women. Not the, it would have been the women from Luke chapter 8. So my sisters, you're included in the ministry of Jesus, amen? Let's get fired up about that right there. It would have been the women. It would have been the 72 apostles that Jesus sent out as well. And we know amongst that group, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 12 to 14, it teaches us that Jesus' mother and his brothers were amongst the disciples. Meaning because Jesus was unwilling to compromise his convictions, his family became disciples. You know, I couldn't help but think about our Friday night devotional, where our dear sister Alondra, as she's here with us, uh, she's a UCLA student. Alondra reached out to her cousin, 
And she got to ask her the two most important questions of her life. And Alondra's cousin was baptized into Christ. But what was extra special about her conversion was Alondra's cousin's sharing. Her and Alondra looked at each other and they said, we're gonna baptize our whole family. The level of conviction, the undetoured, dogged determination of those two individuals where they were not faithless in their stance for the gospel message. They were faithful. Why? Because they're not following men. They're following in the footsteps of their Lord. If he took a stand and it took three years to baptize his family, then they can take a stand and we can baptize our families in our generation. But it says the 3,000 were added to this number, which mean that there was no difference amongst the 3,000 and the 120. Meaning there was no commitment difference between the two groups. It wasn't just the apostles that were super committed. It says everyone was committed. I can't imagine any one of these first century disciples making an excuse while they couldn't show up to the meetings of the body. I, I just, I, I mean, you tell me. Because my, 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 my Bible says here they met together every day. And it says they. It doesn't say some of the 3,000. It says they, including all the 3,000. Nobody had to pull teeth to get them to church. Nobody was too tired to come to church. Nobody had another priority before worshiping God. Nobody had to fight to get anybody to attend the meetings of the body. It says they devoted themselves. You know, we can call it controlling, but you know only those that call it controlling when somebody calls them and says, hey, where you at? Why aren't you at church? You call it controlling because you're not controlled by the love of God. When you don't love the kingdom the way Jesus loved the kingdom, as it says in Acts 20, 28, he didn't just love the kingdom, he laid down his life for the kingdom. And so for us in the 21st century, what's commitment mean to you? There was a post where it said, what if the apostles at the Last Supper gave the excuses we give why we don't show up to meetings of the body. Hey, I'm sorry, um, family just came in town. They had a long walk from Rome. You understand. Hey Jesus, yeah, it's me, Simon, sorry. Uh, my, my wife, we had a bump. I won't be able to make it to church. Hey, you understand, I gotta make my trip to my family's place in Pamphylia. <laughs> you get it though, you understand. But all of us look at that and be like, no, that was the last supper, everybody would have been there. Do you realize every time we come to church, we come to feast on the very words of God. Do you understand that we do not control time, we do not control when the day we live, and we do not control the day we die. So every time we get together could very much so be the Last Supper. What did this commitment produce? We begin with them as 120. 3,000 were added. It goes on in Acts 4, it says that it became 5,000 men. Christianity is for men. You see, now in our generation, you go into churches and you see two demographics, women with kids and older folks, and very few men. Because when you take out the conquest of Christ, you take out the demand of conquerors to be a part of that conquest. But here in God's church, we are not just trying to be part, we're here to take over as conquerors for Christ. But the church spread like wildfire. 
So that by 60 AD, Paul writes the book of Colossians where he says, just 30 years later from this moment, he was able to say, every creature under heaven has heard the gospel. Meaning that they actually started in Jerusalem, went to Judea and Samaria, and got to the ends of the earth. Great commitment. Meant great change all over the world. So ask yourself, when it comes to great commitment, if everyone in the church was like me, what kind of church would this be? Number four, great boldness. You know, in Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are walking along the road as they are walking to worship. They see a crippled beggar. And what do they say as the beggar tries to receive some goods from them? He says, if you got anything, just spare a couple little dollars. Give me some leptin. I want the one-eighth of a penny right now. That's what the cripple was looking for. But what does Peter and John say? Look at us! I don't think that was like, like a command, like a rebuke. I think he was like, dude, I look broke. I ain't got nothing for you. I'm wearing the same sandals that, that they haven't worn out now. They haven't worn out. Just like Jesus promised. But I'm wearing the same sandals I started with when I was walking with Jesus. But we learn here that even though after they perform this incredible miracle that they're questioned by the authorities. And Peter responds in, after, in chapter 4 in verse 8. It says, then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we're being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a cripple in our ass how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. You know, Peter could have easily left out the most convicting part of the message, that the authorities to which he was presented to were the very authorities that killed Christ. He confronted the murderers of Jesus with all boldness and without hindrance. The Bible teaches full of the Holy Spirit. So you could be full of a lot of things. You choose, full of lies, full of cowardice, full of faithlessness, or you could be like Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, and so preach the word of God boldly. It says the Bible would teach in verses 12 to 13 that the authorities for which they were going to kill Peter were stopped in their tracks by the sheer shameless audacity of Peter. That they were taken aback and says, this guy's courageous, but he's also unschooled and ordinary. And we know from the Greek word ordinary means idiote, which is where we get our English word idiot. So he says, even though this guy is an unschooled idiot, that's, that's the Bible, amen? That they took note that they had been with Jesus. So when you lack boldness, it's because you have not been walking with Jesus. I don't care how much you crack open your Bible. If you don't apply and make the Bible your true standard, you will lack the boldness of Christ. And you'll back down in the presence of things that may cause fear. You see, thankfully, Peter obeys God and not these religious leaders. But you learn here from this very passage that they knew how to stop Christianity once and for all. It wasn't to do anything, but simply get them to stop talking about it. Get them to stop speaking in the name of Christ, because that will cease Christianity to exist. So you ask yourself, when it comes to great boldness, if everyone in the church was like me, what kind of church would this be? When you have great boldness and you've been walking with our great God, you cannot help but speak in the name of Jesus. Number five, great power and great sacrifice. Acts chapter four and verse 32, it says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they had with great power. The apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them from time 
to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, bought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. And it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, who the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. What a powerful depiction of our first century brothers and sisters. Because it shows where their heart was. It was in the mission. Their heart was for God's kingdom. Their heart was for God's people. It teaches that the apostles continued to speak powerfully in the name of Jesus. But what accompanied that great power was great sacrifice. It says it as if it's just, it was just the common thing to do. It says from time to time. So in passing, it wasn't a special situation. People sold land, they sold homes, and they gave up their possessions. For what purpose? To sustain the needs of God's kingdom. Wow. It says they gave to anyone as they had need. You know, I think it's special how selfless our first century brothers and sisters were. Yeah. Some sold houses and they trusted God, and so they trusted people. They laid their sacrifice at the feet of the apostles. These are just men, men like you and me. And they laid their sacrifice before them and said, do what this, what you will be led to do by God's Holy Spirit. Give to all those who have need. You know, I think it's incredible because these are the same individuals that literally were displaced from their homes. They did not go back to the places for which they came to celebrate in Jerusalem. The scriptures teach here that they stayed in Jerusalem. And in order for them to establish a presence and to ensure everybody was taken care of, they said, you know what, forget it. I don't need the land back where I'm from. I'm going to lay it down so that God's kingdom is taken care of. We're in special mission season. And I don't see an autonomous congregation here in the first century church. I don't see a church that was just trying to keep the funds for which they got for themselves. I see a church that was sacrificial. That wherever the need was, they met it. Whenever there was a new planting to be had, they sent. Why? Because they were here to give to everyone as he had need. So where's your heart for special missions? Is it a heavy, cumbersome load for you to pay forward? that which you were given freely? You know, I think about the sacrifice it took to have the church in San Francisco, which is where I was baptized eight years ago. You know, in LA, they first got here in 2006. In order to plant this church, those that planted it and were going to be a part of the mission team raised over the course of three years, 93 times their contribution. They raised one year, a 10 timeser, just to plant the church. A 13 timeser, simply to be self sustaining. Then after that, they, sit, they, they raised money to plant more churches. And in 2012, just six years after the church was planted, they planted a number of major pillar churches, one of those being San Francisco. Nobody batted an eye at sacrificing for there to be a church in the bay. So for me, when I look back and I see sacrifice, I don't see a heavy, cumbersome, begrudging thing I need to do. I see it as an opportunity to pay forward that for which I was given freely. How do you see sacrifice for the Lord's kingdom? Do you see it as something you have to do or do you see it as something you get to do? My special missions does not mean just a money amount I'm giving. It means souls getting the opportunity to have the kingdom, that which Jesus was pleasing to give to us. If you don't study out the history of our first century brothers and sisters, and you don't stick closely to the convictions they had about sacrifice, you'll find yourself as a denominational church. Where, hey, it's just about us here locally. We're a community church. I don't see a community church here in the Bible. I see a worldwide movement. So ask yourself, when it comes to this great sacrifice, 
If everyone was like me, what kind of church would this be? Number six, great fear. You cannot build a great church unless you have a great fear of God. You have to fear God. It says in Proverbs 1 and verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Proverbs 9 and verse 10, the Bible teaches the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. If you look over at Acts chapter 5, you read about an account here in verse 1. It says, now a man named Ananias, together with his, his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property with his wife's full knowledge. He kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart? that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and kept for yourself some of the money you receive for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, was it the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died. A great fear seized all who heard that had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that moment, she fell down and at his feet and died. Then the young men came in, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. In Acts 5, we see just the very young church. We see a couple that was going along with the sacrifice that everybody was doing in Acts 4, 32. But they were trying to join in the celebration and giving financially. But they immediately suffered the consequences of their sin. The Bible teaches in response to this that great fear seized the whole church. My brothers and sisters, there must be a great fear of God. We have to respect, which is what the fear the Bible is referring to here, a reverence, a fear of God, a respect for the power of our creator. In Revelation 2.20, Jesus rebukes the, th the church of Thyatira for tolerating Jezebel, who called herself a prophetess. And yet by our teaching led people astray. Jesus' call in this time was and is the call for this time. We do not tolerate sin in God's church. But here's the thing. We do need to show a love and great mercy for individuals and work with them. But we do not tolerate sin. Because this is not our church. This is God's church. We do not tolerate false teaching in God's church. You must not have doctrinal issues because they were all together, unified in mind and thought. We have to actually be our brothers and sisters keepers. What was the issue in Ananias and Sapphira? It wasn't that they held back a sum of money. It was that they decided to be hypocritical and say that they were giving the full amount. It was the hypocrisy. We learn from Ole's contribution that it's not about the amount. It's not about, I love that, the portion. It's about the proportion. That it's all about where your heart was. It's the same issue Jesus had with the Pharisees in Matthew 15. He says, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. You hypocrites. My brothers and sisters, let us have a great fear of God. Because as it says in Exodus 20, 20, it says, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you and keep you from sinning. God calls us to live a righteous life. He calls us to be transparent about our lives. Well, I fear being vulnerable. Well, you're going to have a fear living in the light because everything in the light will be exposed. If you're afraid of living a transparent life, it's because you have darkness in your heart. And anybody who lives in darkness fears the light, as John 3 and 1 John 1, 5 to 10 will teach you. Those who walk in the light live in the light and the truth lives in them. When you have secret sin, when you have secret sin going on in your life, it's because you're not living in the light. 
The Bible teaches when you hold back your sacrifice that you're robbing God. If somebody came into church right now and said, hey, I just came from a grocery store, I just robbed it. Would they be in great fear of what the consequences were? And that's for human authorities. The Bible teaches it's a dreadful thing to fall in the hands of the Lord. Do not lie to the Holy Spirit. How much more when you come before God empty-handed? The Bible teaches the one time to test God is with your finances. He says, test me in this and see if I will not open the flood gates of heaven. And the sacrifice for which we've done this year, has God not opened the floodgates of heaven? Look around as Jacob welcomed us here with this morning. The souls that are here may not have been here last year. But that was not by our own will and strength. That was by our sacrifice and our Lord blessing the sacrifice of our hands. Do not get caught in the miracles. The miracles are simply meant to point you to the message and the one for which originally sent that message, which is our Lord, the God Almighty. When it comes to great fear, if everyone in the church was like me, what kind of church would this be? Number seven, great leadership. We see here a great stance for leadership here in Acts chapter six here, I mean in chapter five, we're gonna see more great leadership here in Acts chapter six. We see as the church continued to grow and after Ananias and Sapphira, that situation was taken care of. As the church grows, so do the problems grow. And we've gotta learn how to deal with those problems. We see here the problem, which was the major problem in the first century was racism. And we're gonna see a problem with the Hebraic Jews who are being overlooked, who are overlooking the Grecian Jews. Look at Acts chapter 6 and verse 1. It says, in those days when the number of disciples was increasing, those days are like these days. The Grecian Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the, the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers, to seven men from among, the, among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen and men full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. You know, the power of this passage, it teaches us that there's no such thing as a perfect church. You know, some may be asking, and I appreciate our dear sister Alicia's communion as she said, I'd like to believe that I was not going to be hurt at the end of the day. Aren't we all Christians? And we all laughed. Why? Because there's no such thing as a perfect church. And the reason why, you may ask, you may be shocked to find out if you pull out your phone, I can help you to find out why the church is not perfect. You hit that corner if you have an iPhone, you press that camera, hold it down and let that camera pop up. But don't keep it forward. Get the face front camera going right there and that'll tell you the reason why we do not have a perfect church. That's the only time you should really be taking selfies, amen? Amen. Narcissism, amen? <laughs> but have you ever felt yourself in a place where your needs were overlooked? Amen, it happens. And I want to apologize if that's how you've been in the West, or I apologize for LA as well, in the Southland and all the Metro Coast. If you ever felt overlooked, we as the leaders are doing our best to fulfill each need, but we are human. And so we would do our best. But I think a huge principle we learn here is that the apostles didn't choose to take care of everything in the church. The apostles delegated responsibility. Because my Bible teaches that every part of the body must do its work. It's not upon your evangelist or your women's ministry leader to take care of every single thing that goes on in the church. In fact, this is why the Jethro principle was even created. Jethro looks at Moses and says, you're doing way too much. You can't answer all these people's problems. Imagine if I tried to disciple 85 people. 
That's how many people are in the West. I would be useless. I would be trying to do everything and therefore in response would be doing nothing. That would be ridiculous. Imagine Ole tried to disciple 130 people. That'd be ridiculous. We need leadership. Great leadership in God's church. There are many needs. It's not just being a Bible talk leader is the only need in God's church. We have counters that are needed for administration. We have more shepherds. We need more shepherds. We need those who have a shepherd's heart. We need those that are willing to serve for kids' kingdom. You know, it saddens me the heart that I've come across for those unwilling to serve our kids' ministry. Many people have thought of themselves, like Romans 12 says, more highly than they ought. That somehow you're above even Jesus. As Jesus teaches, bring all the little ones to me. His heart was for the kids. And you want him to have that same tender heart for you, but yet you won't have that for the little ones in God's kingdom. That is not child care going out over there. That is kids' kingdom. That is the future of God's kingdom. Many of you brothers want to be an evangelist, but you're unwilling to serve. You know how you tell the difference between a leader and a dictator? One sees leadership and servitude as stark contrast, while the other can't tell the difference. You want to lead? Your leadership is equivalent to how much you're willing to serve. And not serving publicly. Ole and myself, yes, we're the preachers for the Metro Coast, but that's not the only position that's needed. We need servants of all kinds. We need those that are not voluntold to serve. We need those that are raising their hands and saying, this is God's kingdom. How can I be of service? In fact, what you came to right now was not the time of giving to you. It was a time for you to come to give. It's time to serve God's kingdom. God's kingdom is like a bus. Imagine if everybody, the bus breaks down and it's time to keep the bus moving. But everybody in the ministry just wants to fill up a seat. Now here's the thing, don't get it twisted. There are some that really need to just stay seated and they need to just rest. They've lived their life. They fought, they're not, their bodies are more frail than what they're even used to. And they need to stay on the bus. But for those who are able-bodied, for those who can actually give, for those who actually have the bandwidth, and I'm not talking about what you think your bandwidth is. I'm talking about what the Lord calls you to have. It is those that need to get their rear behinds off the bus, get behind the bus and push the bus because this is God's kingdom. And without us, the God's kingdom does not continue to move. We need to delegate responsibility. We need people asking for how to serve. You know what's funny? When the presence of God was going to be amongst the Israelites within, the first, within Moses' time, Bezalel and Aholiab said, it is far too much that has been given to us. Tell the people to stop giving. We need that problem here in the 21st century. Where many people are coming up to Ole and myself and the many ministry leaders, and it's overwhelming how much people are desiring to do something for God's kingdom. You know where vision comes from. Well, it says in 1 Samuel 3, it says, In that day the, Lord was, the, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. Helping us to see the correlation when the word of the Lord is prevalent, there are many visions. My Bible teaches that in Proverbs 29, 18, that without revelation, the people cast off restraint. KJV would tell us that it's without vision, the people perish. So when you're not in God's word, you don't have a vision for God's kingdom. And so therefore, your time in God's kingdom will be short. Ask yourself, is the vision that you have for your life or is it for the betterment of God's kingdom? It's time to ask ourselves, in terms of giving to God and great leadership, 
If everyone was like me, what kind of church would this be? Number eight, great persecution. We will never build a great church and not experience great persecution. See, in Acts 7, it says that it's devoted to Stephen. And he's one of the guys who rose up and became a powerful preacher as he served, showing you where the heart and power of God comes is by those that are willing to be servants. But you know, for me, I love the parts of sermons where it's the most inspirational part. So let's drop to Acts chapter 7 and figure out the most inspirational part of the sermon here. And Stephen, we're not going to read all 60 verses. We're just going to read 51 and 60 here. Let's see, let's see the, the culmination. Let's see the climax of his lesson here. Because he's got a, he had a lot of things to say. It says in verse 51, you stiff-necked people, your hearts and ears are still uncircumcised. You are just like your ancestors. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your ancestors did not persecute? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was given through angels, but have not obeyed it. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this, they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen's response is he rebukes the Jews so strongly, they become furious and gnash their teeth. Yeah, shut up! They didn't want to hear anymore. And it says, after this, a great persecution broke out on the church. But we understand what great preaching is going to demand great persecution. You see, here we lay out and see in the scriptures that the apostles did an incredible job by giving Stephen the very spirit, not of them, but of Jesus Christ. You see, when we study the Bible with people, we're not trying to pass on our own weird isms. We're here to transfer the heart of God into another individual, where they would be willing to go anywhere, do anything, and give up everything just like Christ did and just like our first century brothers and sisters did. And so here we see Stephen emulating his older brothers in the faith, and he preaches the word unapologetically. So if you feel a little convicted this morning, don't worry. I'm not here to comfort you, though I am here to comfort the disturbed. But I'm here to also disturb the comfortable. You see, the apostles did not pray for the persecution to cease. The Bible would teach us what was their response to persecution in general. In Acts chapter 4, 29, in their response, when Peter and John got out of prison and they came to the doorstep of the disciples, it said they gathered together on their knees in prayer and didn't say, God, please take this persecution away. Because John 15, 8 says, if they hated me, they'll hate you. So this was not something that they were repulsed by. This was something they were validated by. And so instead of praying to find a way out of being persecuted, which some people try to find a way out of walking with Jesus and not being persecuted. When my Bible teaches in 2 Timothy 3.12, it says those that live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There's no way to do Christianity better than Christ. If they persecuted him, they're going to persecute you also. When you preach God's great word, you're going to receive great persecution. But here, if a church is not receiving persecution, can you say it's the church in the book of Acts? You can't. And so we're not trying to be your nice community church here in Hawthorne. We are here to be Jesus' revolution in the 21st century. We have had enough with soft core Christianity. This is not hometown buffet. If you don't like the word of God, then you can walk out those doors. Because here, we're going to preach the word of God, persecuted or not. But do you back down from persecution? Do you not share? Do you not tell your family about your great commitment? Do you not tell your friends from the world about your great commitment? 
Because you don't want to be persecuted? Ask yourself the question. When it comes to great persecution, if everyone were like me, what kind of church would this be? Number nine, last one. Great joy. You can never have God's great church without great joy. The Bible teaches here in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1. Let's look over there. It says in verse 1, it says, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house. He dragged off men and women and put them in prison. Those who had been scattered, by the, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down into the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out from, of the many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. You know, in Acts chapter 8, Philip reaches Samaria. It says that when the persecution broke out, they didn't scatter frantically and scared. This was a planned scattering. Because it says all who were there in Jerusalem scattered except the apostles. Meaning that they stayed to keep the helm of the church still intact. But they sent the disciples out. And it says they preached the word wherever they went. You know, for our singles ministry, you may not have a campus. But you are living in the footsteps and the sandals of Jesus and the first century disciples because they didn't have a campus neither. But they had wherever their feet were set, just as it says in, John, in Joshua 1, wherever you set your foot, that would be the land for which God would give over to you. So my singles in here, in this building this morning, wherever you set your foot, you need to be preaching God's word. I want to talk to the singles a little bit here. Because you don't understand, why do you feel so tempted to be discouraged all the time? And you look at the campus, and you're like, man, they get, they're always baptizing people. It's because Satan knows you are the closest to being like the ministry of Jesus. And so he knows who to distract the most. Do you understand that the movement is built off the backbone of singles ministry? You have the most liquid cash. So you can support the young campus interns. You can support the continuous expansion of the gospel, both numerically and geographically. But somehow we look at our lot as not as good. Instead of finding every excuse to share, you find the quick opportunity out of sharing your faith. I'm tired. I'm sure Jesus was tired when he was on that cross and he shared his faith one last time. As all the blood is leaving his body. I'm sure Jesus was tired when he was walking up the Via Della Rosa with a 110 pound patibulum on his shoulders and he got to share his faith with Simon, as we know was the father of two brothers in the church in Rome. I'm sure Jesus was tired. My brothers and sisters, I know we're fighting hard. We're putting out everything, but it's upon us to see a great joy in our city. It's on us to preach God's word unhindered and unapologetically. There was only great joy because Philip had preached the word by the Holy Spirit. You see, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus' promise and vision for the church was to go from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria. And we learn here from the passage of Scripture that Philip had reached Samaria, and he continued to preach the word. It would go on to tell you that he preaches the word, many evil spirits shriek, and they come out, and there are many healed. He would go on to convert one of the most powerful men in Simon the Sorcerer. He would go on after that to convert the Ethiopian eunuch who was the treasurer of Ethiopia, which is why to this day Ethiopia has some still presence of Christianity in it. Philip's unwillingness to stop his proclamation of God's word, his unwillingness to stop to spread the joy of God's word as it closes out with the account of the Ethiopian eunuch, it says what happened after the Ethiopian eunuch was baptized? It says he went away rejoicing. Great joy was brought. Look to the brothers and sisters that have been baptized in this year 
And you tell me if you see great joy. Because when I look at the brothers and sisters that have been baptized in the West and the Southland, and we come to church and we hear the singing, even though you guys didn't even know the songs, I was dying. I was like, man, they don't know this song. But you know what it didn't stop? Your joy. Because when Jacob got up here, everybody was like, yes, we're at church. I'm fired up. You know why? Because great joy seizes all of the Metro Coast. And that's because of the Word of God. But we're not here to have great joy just in the Metro Coast. We're here to have great joy all over the world. And I didn't go to London, but I got to see the good news from London. I know everybody did. All the sisters were like, if, you, if I want to get married, I better move to London. Because in London, our brothers and sisters over there in Europe, we have a church in Europe family. That's awesome. This is not a movement that is just based here in LA. It's a movement all over the world. Great joy is encompassing the globe. They had some miracles happen there, which produced great joy. One dating couple, daily engagements. <laughs> daily engagements. I mean, everybody was on a knee one time a day. Jeez. Seven engagements. They had one wedding. They sent out two mission teams. And they had daily baptisms to close their conference. Can you say it? Great joy is seizing our brothers and sisters, not just here, but even in Europe. Every baptism is a miracle. Every baptism reminds us of the great joy for which we shared when we came out of the waters of baptism. But we have to ask ourselves, if everybody in the church had joy like me, what kind of church would this be? It's time for us to ask ourselves some questions here today and evaluate your life. So not just say that I would read about the book of Acts, but that I can actually live out the book of Acts. But simply keep asking yourself as we go through the Acts series, if everybody in the church was like me, what kind of church would this be? And to God be all.